conversation. Mm. Um, the, he, uh, I want to introduce you to Michele. This is Saga. Do you go by Saga? Saga is good. Yeah. And um, Trend Union, otherwise known as Ragna. <laughs> Good to have another mode of conversation. So just your life, just um, so you know. They, they, I'm going to put uh, it uh, I list. introduce you to Michaela. Ah, is what is Saga. that? You go by Saga? I'm Saga is good. There's a slight delay in when it uh, streams to YouTube. It's like a couple of seconds, so you heard yes. So now I just turned it off, but it is streaming, and I'm going to broadcast now. So once I broadcast, people are just coming in. So just so you know, and I will turn off my picture and um, Saga, can you change your type, your name to like New York Textile Month, please? Yes. And um, Textile Month, and here, and so good luck, look forward to here. I'm Me to too. Stop <laughs> and broadcast one, two, three, yes. I want to put some music on, but uh, somehow I can't figure that out. You know how when everyone's waiting and like waiting for the talk to start and it's just kind of awkward. <laughs> I mean, you, we can see we have about 15 people, 16 people coming in already. Oh, but they're in the waiting room, right? They're here. We're on. So, oh, yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> here, I'll put on a song. <laughs> can you hear it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let me not get too caught up in that. Where are the other people, though? I don't see. Oh, because we don't do that. Um, it's not a grid, right? We're not. We don't get to see all those other people. You do. Well, if you click participants at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to see. Oh, look at that. I see. Okay. Then I can scan like who's already on here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and uh, there's a Q&A function, which people can use. So I'll be saying all of those things. And I will, after my intro, I will leave you to, to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Was there a specific reason, Saga, that you're wearing your Keith Haring t-shirt? It's for you. <laughs> I love it. You got it. <laughs> yeah. It's great. What's the weather like? Oh my god, injuries. Ouch. Dog bites. <laughs> oh, that's right. The dog. That's a sad story. I won't make you tell it to this audience. <laughs> I like the neon um, kind of halo. That's our showroom. I don't recognize that. Uh, it's uh, downstairs. We furbished uh, the basement. Oh. And everything quite raw. Very nice. Yeah. It sticks out of my head, the neon light. It's good. <laughs> yeah, if you, you could actually, there, look at that. Oh my God, perfect. <laughs> oh, all right. What's the weather like in Zurich right now? Uh, we have uh, one of the hottest day again. It's summer after having really a huge dip in temperature the last week, and then it's back uh, to lovely summerish weather. So, oh, yeah. nice. I wish we had that, but we have cool. Um, oh. Cool, yeah. How do I stop my iTunes now? Quit iTunes, there we go. Get serious. So we have about 43 people with us right now. I'm gonna give it a couple more minutes for people to roll in and then uh, we can start. I used to live in Zurich, actually. <laughs> Saga, I know you're from somewhere. Right I, I, uh, I watched uh, a few programs which you hosted and I know you from somewhere. Really? I don't know oh where you are, but That's you look cool. very, very familiar and uh, 
you were a designer at one point, right? Yes, yes, I am. For, for who did you work? I mean, IDEO, Frog, um, Wolf Olins. I worked at, in branding and strategy. And uh, then at Pentagram. I was in Zurich working with a strategy company with Thomas Kavchik. What was it called? It was Artesia. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No. Right? Yes, yes. I am. All right. I'm just going to start I now. Do, uh, um, Wolf Olins. I work at, in branding and strategy. Ragna, we can hear your um, mic. So maybe I'm going to. I'm going to. Yeah, that's good. Hi, everyone. Welcome to New York Textile Month. We're so happy to have you all with us. Um, today, um, I want to tell you a little bit about a celebration that is New York Textile Month. It's a month long festival designed to highlight and bring together the textile community in New York City. Uh, I'm Sagarika Sundaram. I'm the deputy editor of Towing Textiles, which is a publication that we publish annually. This initiative is founded by Lee Edelcourt, who, um, you know, she has a long history in trend forecasting and bringing together initiatives that promote textiles and art and design. Um, today on Textile TV, uh, we have Liz Collins with us. I'm so happy to have her uh, present a series every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. And this is the first of the, that series. Uh, Liz is in conversation every week with her, a series of her collaborators and partners talking about her work. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Liz. Thank you so much, Saga. This is such a thrill for me to do this um, and an honor to be here. And I just looked at the list of 60 so far participants. And, you know, I love to think of um, all of you doing whatever you're doing right now alongside listening to slash watching this talk. Um, I personally have been a, an avid um, participant in these talks during the pandemic, um, both as a, as a speaker and a conversant, but at, also as an audience member so often. And I can't say enough about how these talks have really carried me through this time in terms of like intellectual stimulation, um, connection, um, learning things. I feel like I've learned more about some artists I know than I would if I just talked to them, <laughs> you know, because people are really um, sharing a lot during this time. And it's really beautiful that we get to do this. So thank you. And I owe a lot of gratitude to Lee for starting New York Textile Month five years ago because um, it's something we really needed and it's um, wonderful that we had someone come from far away to um, New York to pull us all together in this great way so that we have a kind of tighter community and a platform to share information with each other and our work and um, all kinds of things and connect with others like we're doing right now. So um, I am here with Michele Rondelli, who is one of my favorite textile industry people. And uh, we're here to talk together. I decided with this um, series of talks that what I wanted to do is uh, interview some of my colleagues who I work with because I have done several talks. I think they're ar archivally now, they're probably about 15 or so different conversations I've had during pandemic. Um, and I like to sometimes turn the tables and interview other people. Uh, and also I, I just, I think when Ragna asked me what I was doing for textile month and if I had something to contribute um, right away, what popped into my mind was that I wanted to do a series of conversations with, uh, some of my textile industry collaborators because I feel like they often don't get as much attention. And also there's, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, as many of you know, from working in textiles, um, you know, with the factories, like manufacturing is such a big 
kind of world. And I, I find it fascinating. And the people I work with who are tied so closely to textile mills um, have a lot of knowledge and information and experience that sometimes um, kind of people who are interested in textiles but don't work in the industry don't get to hear about or don't get to see. So some of that is what I'm what I'm really interested in exploring and kind of talking about like where we're at now. And um, I mean, Suzanne's talk was really great to hear about some of the industry stuff. And so anyway, um, Michele Rondelli is a interior designer, a textile designer, an art director, an architect, a business owner, and someone I met um, some years back at uh, a design fair called Sight Unseen, I think it was called Offsite, where we were both showing um, new collections. And at the time I was doing a big chunky woven rug project with some friends of mine and was presenting that to the world. And Michele and his partner, Adam, were presenting uh, their collection of textiles under four spaces and um, were debuting the collection of Natalie Dupasquier and uh, Georges, I forget his last name, but his, her collaborator. So I'll let Michele talk about that. But what I want to say um, without reading Michele's beautiful bio is that um, he's worked in the textile industry for decades, for over 30 years, and has worked at some of the best textile companies in the world. And um, just, he has so much knowledge about mills and customers and, um, I remember at the fair, we just, we didn't really get to know each other until the end. And then we just started chatting and had that immediate kind of like, we like each other, you know? And, and um, that's just such a great way to get something going, you know, when it, and it happens so organically. Like sometimes people wonder how these things happen. How did you collaborate with that great French Blah, blah, blah. You know, like, how do these things happen? And I remember when I was a student, I felt like there was so much mystery. Like, how do these things actually happen? How do people find those connections? And in my experience, a lot of it happens face to face um, in impromptu ways where you don't have something planned. And then all of a sudden there's a spark. And some of it just gets down to kind of basic personality and chemistry and energy connection. And so we had that, Adam and Michaela and I, and we just started talking and, and, and then it unfolded into a studio visit and we'll talk about that some more later. So uh, welcome Michaela. Welcome all, here we are in Zurich. <laughs> so um, what, what I've, asked Michele to do for the, for the beginning of this presentation is to show about his work and his company. And so this will be about 10 minutes of learning about Michele's world. Thank you so much for being here. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm really flattered also what you just said. I, I take myself as a much humbler person. <laughs> And all these like what we did but as a matter of fact at my age uh, I have to say we did some pretty cool stuff and uh, or I did some pretty cool stuff always um, in relationship with my cool people and uh, I played the cards which life was giving me also sometimes I had to be asking for something to happen and um, and it actually always happened. I wanted to go to America, work in America, because the market was so incredible back then. And I found uh, you know the opportunity. And I spent ten years in America. And then I thought like ah, I should learn Spanish. And uh, I went three months down to Spain to learn this language. And then I stayed another six years just picking up work and being involved in like very interesting projects. Uh, my background is uh, 
um, architecture and design, interior design. I started in Paris and I deliberately started in Paris because back then in Europe, it was very hard to uh, find these art schools. You either had the very uh, specific art school for painters, graphic designers, or then the architect school, like the proper uh, ETH, as we call it here, proper architects, more focusing on uh, engineering, structural, like I, I wanted to find uh, something where I can actually understand the whole process and not just like have um, a degree in, in, in one direction. So in Paris, they at the ESAM, it's the Ecole Supérieure Art Moderne. It was some sort of like an art school, but they uh, offered already these courses where you studied um, the whole complexity of like a design process. You you analyzed what it needs to be uh, to be a designer to fulfill the creative part. But then also understand what is the commercial part of it, and what uh, is the re what are the requirements in the um, in the production, and uh, so I came out of these studies with like an incredible broad knowledge, and uh, then my problem was basically to find a job where I could apply all that. And uh, from day one, I, I was uh, always engaged in projects where we had a very demanding client. We had uh, a nice mill or a producing a manufacturer behind, and we had to develop the next phase, the next step. Now, I'm talking about 85, 90, 1990, uh, just to remind you, uh, you know, America was thinking beige and Bordeaux. Uh, the espresso machines were all sitting in Italy. Uh, we had the filtered coffee in America. Uh, it was like, it was a very, very uh, closed in design world. And um, my big breakthrough was when I went to the opening of the Memphis show back in 1984, I think, or 85, uh, where Memphis showed just a new world of thinking, like letting everything go, letting, uh, ignoring everything what was told to you in schools, uh, just really breaking it through. Does a bed need to be on the bed or could it look like a box ring? Uh, is a lamp a lamp or can you have the shape of an animal and just, uh, beam the light source in a different way. Anyway, it was so refreshing and interesting that back then, uh, of course, I was uh, very young, half a student still, and I tried to get in touch with these people. It was impossible. And, um, you know, but I was always impressed back then. And it took me like 30 years later to go actually back to the same people, which were still, uh, out there and uh, thinking the same way in their 60s, 70s, and uh, where you know we wanted to look at the archives, what they did, perhaps re-edit uh, some of the works, and uh, it became very clear that they did not want that. They said, "Why should we create something we did 30 years ago if we can do it now, something new and better?" And again, it was such uh, such a breakthrough for me not to repeat uh, things, uh, to go into projects and thinking really what's the best for the client, for the product. And uh, even when I started to work with Liz uh, in that studio visit, it was exactly a little bit like how I work. I like I have a lot of things coming at me, and sometimes I have no answer. I like the person, I like the work but I have no answer to think, how can I incorporate that in a project or in a fabric or whatever? And it sits there and sometimes it takes two, three, four years until I find, uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm asked to work on a project for, for example, we did the Swiss Re uh, headquarters here in Zurich, uh, where I all of a sudden had this idea, oh my God, I saw this fantastic work from this artist and uh, 
we should see if we can actually weave carpets with that uh, thing. But it sat basically three, four years in a box and I didn't know what to do. And with Liz, actually the same. We looked at this work and the studio visit took hours and hours, was fantastic. I love studio visits because, uh, you know, Liz had a nice presentation, everything prepared which I was not interested to see. I said, like, Liz, I want to see the boxes, you know, the piled away boxes. And then she comes with this box and we started to go through these little uh, samples um, uh, of hand-woven tapestries. And, uh, and all of a sudden I saw like, you know what, this is so fantastic. Let's do something with this. Or your work you did, uh, uh, I think for like uh, a project also with these lines, the wallpaper lines, I'm going to show it actually to you. Uh, also, I said like, let's do a wallpaper out of it. I, I clearly could click uh, the idea, the source of creativity with the product and you exactly this has to go on that paper so that we can actually transmit the spirit of the of the work. And I'm just going to share now my screen. So uh, you see, I just prepared really a very small presentation. So Four Spaces is basically a company uh, I started 10 years ago. Um, I was working back then for a very fancy couture company, Jacob Schlapfer. Uh, we did a lot of uh, textiles for uh, the catwalks, Mark Jacobs, Chanel, you know, all these big names which are doing these fashion shows. And, uh, and they had this idea to create this home line and I was with them for five years until they got sold and helped them to, to develop that line. Uh, during that time, um, unfortunately, I realized that a lot of designers are just really doing incredible works and was always sold under the company and uh, and the credits would actually be in my opinion a little bit displaced because uh, you know i thought like why is there a problem to actually say design made by in your case for example Liz collins and not just buy four spaces so uh, i wanted to start to give a platform to young artists, young textile designers, uh, renowned artists, uh, sort of like to, to edit their work and edit it with, uh, with some sort of like a, a hand or a guidance so that it all comes together. You know, we don't want to be a French salad, a mixed French salad, as I say. Sometimes we have so many crazy things where I say, this is so beautiful. I, I really have to find the way how it can become part of, uh, of the company. And for spaces, if you go on our website, you will see that we do a lot of different uh, fabrics. We do, of course, contract uh, work with the biggest architect offices. They come to us and like, oh, we have this project. You have to design a fabric. We, uh, we work also um, you know, with uh, residential designers, we work with like, uh, you know, all the industry, basically. We work with uh, mattress people. They want us to do like a, a mattress cover, which has, you know, which is a little bit more uh, sourceful and perhaps a little bit more sustainable. Now, I made a decision uh, very early on that uh, all our work, and that's why we don't actually promote it, because it's part of our philosophy. Our work is as much sustainable as we can and as ethical as we can. So I'm not interested to weave something further away than 500 kilometers from where we live. Uh, I'm, I'm not particularly interested to work with people or mills uh, abundant amount of mills. We work with like three or four mills where we actually also do their our investments on their looms. We sometimes go and reactivate looms which were old, 50 years old, and we spend the money to renovate them so that we can actually weave a new quality on it or reactivate it. And, uh, and we are sustainable. So we, we really believe in that. It's the only future we have, this planet. I don't have to repeat myself, we all know the problematic, but I also don't want to make the 
the consumer responsible for that? Because I think the responsibility for sustainability is not only with the consumer deciding, do I want a plastic bag or not? I have nothing against plastic bags as long as these bags are made the way that they are biodegradable with sun and rain, they would become earth again, fertilizer to the earth. So, and there are many uh, concepts already in that direction. I was uh, working on a, on a program called Climatex Lifecycle, the first biodegradable fabric uh, that's 20 years old. Uh, together, I think it was Design Tech. Uh, it was a huge program. We had to finance a lot of different developments. And uh, so I think it was Carnegie, Design Tech, and, and uh, the mill in Switzerland, and uh, EPA Michael Braungard in Hamburg, who was uh, co hosting the whole thing. He was an ex Greenpeace activist. But that was like back then we started to understand we have we as a manufacturer have to be responsible for what we put out and uh, so that's the way how we started we started in a small parking public garage we rented a box uh, five by two meters 40 just to park a car that was our first warehouse and uh, here we are 10 years later we have a proper warehouse now in Italy and uh, we, we are luckily in the position that we can uh, uh, fabricate for very renowned and, and uh, on international level uh, projects and work with the, with the nicest architects we have and creative people. So one section is, for example, metallics. Of course, every textile designer works with metallic yarn. So here we did uh, a, a collection using real metallics so it's bronze copper and inox steel i wanted to have it three meter wide and i wanted to have it as a blackout so the back of the fabric is uh, la uh is it's double weave so we have in the back a trivia cs fiber and the front is this uh, metal and then it's coming out from the production, it's hand crushed, and it's just really an absolutely stunning product because I always want to do something like this. So we had to, we, we definitely wanted to do. Then a collection a few years ago got actually awarded with the New York Design Prize from Interior Design, uh, Stripe Tees, also a fantastic collaboration with like uh, internship back then, which is now our uh, designer or works in our design department, Celine. Um, I had to open photographs to approve for the press and uh, probably the downloading didn't happen properly. So uh, when I opened up, it had a glitch and I started to screenshot them. And then we started this whole crazy process to develop a software where we can actually uh, produce glitches. So all the stripe tees are basically photographs we took and then we developed this software where we can put the cursor on the image and it just renders the colors. So that's why you have extremely beautiful uh, uh, color graduations in that, in, in that palette. And we had 2,000 photographs, 2,000 design, and we have to we had to strip it down to like 53. And uh, so that was a, a very nice concept entering uh, into the wallpaper. Uh, then we had uh, the knitting. So that was also something uh, very interesting. I, I knew this uh, Italian gentleman uh, who always was my mentor when it came to weaving. I, uh, we, I, I knew him from a nice collaboration and we had such a nice friendship and he became really a mentor. So I called him, it's like, uh, or he called me actually and says like, Michaela, you have to come down. It's like, it's so sad what's happening to Italy because all these knitting companies are going out of business. They are all knitting now in China. And uh, don't you, wouldn't you like to do uh, a collection with like using the knitting technique. And it was a, a process which was like, took me almost two years uh, to produce that first knitted fabric. Uh, you know, the knitting machines, they work with elastic uh, 
uh, yarns like wool, mohair, um, nylons, elastic nylons or polyesters. And we came in and said, like, it has to be contract. So we have to make it Travere CS. Super hard, stiff yarn needs to be oiled before weaving so that it can glide nicely. So I don't want to tell you how many times we broke a machine, but uh, we needed a lot of goodwill from, from the production as well to enable that. That collection is uh, started with one fabric, and now we have a palette of about 20, uh, 15 articles in it. So it's really a beautiful. It's for shears and uh, for upholstery. Uh, another thing which was always uh, the way we work, we create always qualities which then I uh, develop further. So Plastic Fantastic was this plastic sort of like it was not male, it was not female, it was this like no gender textile, if I can call it like this, it was like it just did always what you wanted to do, you can crush it. You can uh, project colors on it, uh, and it just takes that that color and it reflects also the colors. It was like it acts like a, a stained window when you have a print on it, and then you have the light going through it. It actually uh, projects that print onto uh, the space. So this is again a fabric which uh, a lot of people at the beginning didn't know how to use and what to do and uh, until they started to realize it's actually really this like super cool uh, fabric so that's a creation and then we decided to uh, branch into zigzag zurich uh, that's uh, whereas four spaces is covering the uh, amd community as an editor uh, zigzag zurich is a, a business to uh, consumer e2c and uh, we developed, uh, we started to invite people, uh, designers to work with us on uh, collaboration. So we produce bed linens, uh, bed sheets, we produce uh, blankets, cotton blankets. Um, we produce wool blankets and we sell them online. So perhaps here you see that uh, Zigzag Zurich grew really tremendously, especially through the pandemic, uh, where uh, everything came a bit to a, a halt. Uh, we saw a really increasing uh, online business with like uh, Zigzag Zurich people clearly wanted to spend or clearly spent more time at home and wanted to upgrade or just change the sheets or they had a new girlfriend, they wanted to impress the girlfriend or whatever. But it was, uh, so here we work really, we have, that's like fashion. I mean, that's a machine, um, uh, Samira Vicinanzo is heading our press and marketing. She is, uh, she made it very clear that she needs these collections delivered on time and uh, she wants, it's like fashion. So we have two collections per year and uh, that's a, it's a huge machine where we have to find these artists um, going through all the portfolios sent in, deciding uh, who we choose. And then we have to actually start to work with every single artist on what do we wanna do, coloring, pattern. Uh, as good as we assist, uh, there's always this creative part which has to be uh, satisfied also from the artist part artistic part point of view um so the whole team here and i'm really blessed to have a, a fantastic team we are about 10 people here in zurich and uh we work uh really on we love to work on architect uh collaborations so this one here was for example uh, a project with like herzog Dömeron the Paris Art Museum in Miami, where we develop a fabric for the auditorium. It was a cork fabric. You see it here a little bit in the dark version. It was this olive uh, green cork fabric, specially developed for this project now in our collection. And then we printed these shears uh, and they're actually hiding this like really seven layers of acoustical packages, which are highly unattractive. 
And we had this idea to actually put this like super fine chorchette kind of shear as the outest layer on it. And it just transmitted this like refinement to the space. Um, here we work with uh, Swiss Re, uh, that's the new headquarters where we collaborated on the carpets. Uh, that was a collaboration with like Wade Guyton. Uh, don't have to introduce you to him. He's like a super famous architect uh, based in New York. He uh, was all, also fantastic to work with because he just said like, you know, you know so much about the techniques. Uh, uh, you helped me to find the right product for this design. So not only did we weave the carpets, but then they started to actually screen print these furnitures with the matching parts of the designs going over and picking up that design. So it was really a stunning, stunning project. Uh, here, another view where we worked uh, on the, with another artist on the cubicle. Um, and, uh, you know, to work with these projects, you work not only with the designers, you actually had the whole politics going on with like a super corporate client. These guys are coming from insurance. And I remember when we had the mock-ups and we showed this work for uh, my through Pere, these uh, dots, uh, they had the board meeting and there was this uh, Asian group saying it's like, oh, ho, ho, it looks just like a shower curtain. And uh, that then uh, sort of like created this whole crisis uh, and we had to go and, and sort of like defend the artistic point of view. And they wanted to basically put uh, this, uh, you know, put the films on the glasses, kill all the entire idea with this, uh, with this draperies. Um, and, and it took a lot of know-how and uh, sensitivity to, to not only be resistant to critics, but also to really take it also yourself serious, thinking, okay, are we going too far? Or is it correct? Or is it worth to fight for this or to bring over our opinion? And we succeeded, as you can see. The outside curtain was a, a wool drapery. Uh, we developed also for that space. Uh, this was a fun project where Louis Vuitton came to us and says, like, you have to produce this back uh, lounge um, uh, for a fashion walk in, I think it was in Monte Carlo. And with, uh, again, with an artist collaborator with Justin Morin, he would just develop these crazy designs and, and we just made it happen. So that was like a, a nice collaboration. And then we are doing residential work. That was my recent project with like David uh, Chipperfield. Uh, the London and the Berlin office. It's a private house. Uh, here, it was all about finishes, all about putting, uh, you know, understanding what happens if you go around that line, uh, you know, ar around that corner. You go around the corner, and what do you see? It was, uh, I mean, most talented architect and. Uh, you know, also, I think they started to enjoy at the beginning, they were a bit nervous that we started to work as in tears people on, on their project, but then they started to understand they have so much uh, taste and uh, again, sensitivity to understand what we want and uh, to give really to, to make the project look uh, uh, fulfilled and, uh, you know, reach the hundred percent what you wanted to reach. Because in the project, in any kind of uh, work, you are always exposed. We are producing raw fabric. So we are always exposed to, to what happens with the contractor, what happens with the workroom. And you, you have to control that too. I mean, that's sometimes hard to do it, but that's where quality is defined at the end uh, in a project. This was the BBVA headquarters. That was also a knitted fabric because with the knitting fabric, we were able to control the glare and the light transmission. So this was a very difficult uh, space uh, where it had huge windows on top of this oval building. And uh, we developed this uh, knitted fabric just uh, for them to control 
uh, that light so that you can actually be in that space without wearing sunglasses. Yeah. And then the artist collaborations, and that's where I come to my end of the presentation, uh, is, uh, of course, this Memphis collaboration, Natalie Dubasque, George Soden, artist by now, uh, still doing some design. Uh, here you see an installation from the Kunsthalle in Wien, where we were uh, producing all the wallpaper installations. And, and next to it is an idea of a carpet. We would like to think about, you know, this layering of designs. Uh, Memphis, as I told you at the beginning, was my inspiration. And uh, Ettore Sozzas and all these works, like, it's not over. It's like, just really, like, it, it, it just got such a push. Uh, and then people think like, oh, it's out of fashion. You have to think differently about these things. Like you have things which are out of fashion, but you have things which are part of our culture and history, and you have to look at them like this. Uh, you can't go in and study that work. It's incredible. If you want to learn about perspective, uh, dimensions, what can a wall absorb as a dimension, then you have a good, good, good understanding in their work. Um, and then we do, this was an exhibition for the Jewish Museum in New York, Mark Kamil Chaimovitz, he came to us, a dear friend, we, he came with these crazy designs of him and we wove all the fabrics uh, for him. Uh, Dorothy Fisher, interior designer based in Brooklyn, she is for me the one lady which deserves much more. <laughs> Uh, what she actually, where she is now, she does these most incredible tapestries, metal tapestries. And I commissioned a few pieces with her for an exhibition here. And I'm ever so glad to give her work because she's truly talented. She, you see her here, how she's weaving a little bit. She puts it on that rack and, and she has these metal things. She has to wear this gloves so that she doesn't cut herself. And she crinkles it and she goes in with, fires to oxidize the metals. It's just incredible, her work. Uh, Justin Morin, fashion, coming from the fashion. He's based in Paris. Uh, we did this uh, beautiful print work on tool for collective design. This one here for, was for Etude, the fashion catwalk. And, and now we are just furbishing also to the shops in Paris. Uh, so. This is where, again, we connected with Justin, I think through Instagram and it's just, it just became so clear, just like as we did it with Liz here, her works, we actually edited. Uh, once we want to do something, it's just a matter of time. So it's like, and, and, and then Lynn, uh, Liz was also, trusting us to, you know, not getting involved in like, do we want to print on what quality? Obviously I was not printed, I was not interested in print vinyl. So we printed on the European version class A, which is washable as well, but it just feels like a paper. And, uh, and that one here, that little one, uh, that bang, as we call it, was like coming out from that box, uh, uh, as a little tapestry. And uh, I thought it was just the right time to actually do a bang because we needed a bang in this world. <laughs> and funny enough, then that's how it continues. Then, uh, you know, this was the, the entrance for the MAD Museum in New York. And Liz was contacting me and says like, would you be interested to produce this one? It's like, yes, of course, you know, we, we, edit whatever you think. And that was such a great entrance uh, with her work, uh, printed on a complete different material now, so that they stick it. Uh, it's a stainless steel entrance, basically, all like this uh, polished uh, elevators, and we covered it all with black. And I thought like it was like really a fantastic uh, way uh, to show her work once again. So that's my presentation. I go and stop sharing that screen. And I gave it over to you. I hope I covered a little bit what you wanted me to cover. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. That's a great comprehensive presentation. It's 
wonderful to hear you talk about your work and your history. Um, really inspiring. I have a lot of questions, but um, before asking them, I just want to do a couple things, which is one, show you this because I happen to have the paper right here. So I just wanted people to be able to see like the quality, it's paper. So this is, this is some of the printed wallpaper um, that Four Spaces produced and it's beautiful. Um, maybe we can, I don't know. I, I'm interested in talking about the unmarketability of this product, <laughs> but um, I also wanna show you this, which is a sample. This is something um, that I generated. This is a sample of a wallpaper I call acid rain wallpaper. And I just wanna, this is one more project that Michaela and I did together, well, Four Spaces and I. Um, I'd like to share my screen with you and show you just a few pictures from an installation that I did called um, Cast of Characters. And oops, oh geez, where is that? Here we go. So um, this was a project at the only queer bookstore in New York City called the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. And you can see um, on the boxes, the cardboard boxes, it's their logo, BGSQD. This bookstore is inside of the LGBTQ Center in the West Village on 13th Street, which is an incredible historical building um, that has been a hub of queer culture for decades. And so I transformed the bookstore um, into this kind of crazy reading room salon situation that had um, inspiration with Victorian salons and um, also some of the Memphis stuff that Michaela was talking about. I'm also a Memphis freak, you know, I'm really hooked on all of that and have been for years and, and that's part of why we get along so well. But um, in here is an exhibition of a hundred queer artists, a portrait exhibition. And so I created this wallpaper that had a whole story around um, global warming. I used a chart from the New York Times that I discovered that was um, the raising of the earth's temperature over a hundred years. And those are what those, these dots are. And there's a grid too, it's like a very subtle grid. And then um, on top of that are these strange kind of surreal flowers. So I had this idea about this fragile kind of ecosystem that was starting to become very surreal, like you see in sci-fi movies and global warming kind of pushes those, those envelopes of like plants blooming at weird times and so on. So anyway, that was an additional um, project that was a really incredible project to do with Four Spaces because um, I mean, making the wallpaper with them was just so wonderful. And, and the, the design team, like I did all of the design work, the artwork preliminary, and then them, the team helping put them into a better repeat and then doing the coloring to fix things and, and then the strike offs and everything. It was fantastic. And I just have to say that this pro wallpaper installer who does a lot of high end um, installation of wallpaper in New York, could not believe the quality of the wallpaper. He was like, I've never seen wallpaper of this quality. It's like the best. So anyway, um, there's, let's see if I have a couple more pictures. It's just a really wonderful wallpaper. My mom actually took some of this and <laughs> put it in her house and it's really beautiful. Um, and the artwork is a whole other thing. And, and we did a, um, a catalog, there's a review, and then I think there's one more picture of the catalog. Here we go. So uh, if you go to the BGSQD um, website, I think they still have some catalogs and it holds, it talks about the process of the project and artworks. Anyway, so um, pause, share. I'm going to stop sharing, stop, share. Okay, here we are back together. Uh, yeah, so. We don't have a ton of time left. We have 15 minutes left. And I didn't say at the beginning that people are welcome to put some uh, your questions in the chat. Although I wanna say that we might not have 
time for too many um, questions to be answered because I have some questions about um, um, Michaela, things that you said. Um, I am very, very, very interested in this no gender textile concept. Um, you mentioned in the plastic fantastic product that it's neither male nor female, it's a no gender textile. And <laughs> I don't know if I've ever heard that expression before. And I think maybe um, other people might have hooked on to that and been like, huh, what? So I just want you to unpack that for us because it's um, very compelling and also related to that textile itself, which I'm dying to experience now. Like, what does it feel like? Can you, can you talk some about that idea and the, a little more about the fabric? Yeah, the idea is actually quite simple. I don't, I, you know, I, I think about every product, pro, uh, product or project always like, what is it? And, and clearly, you know, it can't be any more just, as I say, male or female or wrong or bad or uh, whatever are these words you can put against each other. I think uh, you as a person or today, I, I get up in the morning and I put my foot on a piece of carpet, which I selected because I want to have that feeling. So it's a nice fine carpet or it's a wool carpet, whatever you like. And then you go into the bathroom and, and you have your things like you want to have. And you go into the kitchen, you make your coffee, you, you sit down in your living room. It's like this world you created. And I would like to, to it's obviously a world you feel safe and you feel comfortable. And I would like that you take that world out. Now you leave your house and that the staircase you're going down is safe, has good lighting, you feel safe, you go into uh, the subway, you go to your working place, you, you go to a restaurant to have lunch, you go to an airport, uh, you go into an airplane. It's like, I would like to keep that level of, of, of like feeling comfortable and safe uh, throughout there. Perhaps you get sick and you have to go into a hospital. You know, like hospitals were like, for me, the worst samples for like how we can actually neglect people. You go into a shop in the hospital and the toothpaste is all the way down. You have the sugar uh, chocolates on that level here. And you had to, in a hospital, it's like the indication, the signage in a hospital compared to like a shopping mall where you have banquets in every hallway. Uh, where you can rest, you have palm trees and these fancy things you, 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 you design like this would be our world. So I would like to make, design that. So, and, and to reach that point, you have to always think like, what, what is the temperature of a fabric? What's the sex of a fabric? What's the, what is everything? How you want to define, how you want to put it into a definition. And if you want a word, use these words, male, female, Fine, use them. Uh, you know, Philip Stark was doing a hotel in New York. It was very male until Andre Putman opened another hotel and it was very female. It was like paid completely different attention to details than what he did. Both superb, but it's just like make you understand like, is this the design of a woman or is this the design from a man? And uh, so we had this idea, I'm teaching at, uh, at the art school here in Zurich as well and give quite a few workshops. So I see the students and, and the students, they, they just don't want to be anymore this totally in this definition. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes tell them it's like, okay, we have a workshop, but I actually would like that you forget everything what we learn here again, because you have to create it in yourself. You have to know who you are, who not. And I, I see this uh, very transitional, uh, we are in a time where everything flows into each other. So we came across this yarn and it's actually a, just a tape yarn. And I said, can we weave a few fabrics? And then we got it from the machine. It's like, 
this fabric has no sex, has no smell, has no nothing. It's completely what he wants to be. And, and I thought that was really the, the reason why we created that fabric. The sellability is something else because you come with something which is so new to people. Uh, no, it's not uh, color too beige of a linen or of a wool or something very clear in our heads. It's something where you have to actually start thinking how you want to use this fabric and perhaps start to give a different feeling to a space. Great, thank you. That that's illuminating. Um, I, a side note, I wanted to mention about the um, Shamowitz show that I, I think I saw that before I met you, and I just that show was just unbelievable. And um, it's wonderful that you all collaborated with him. I um, I won't go into the details of that exhibition right now, but I think for anyone who's interested in art and design, like the kind of intersection, um, the way I am um, and the way you are, Michele, I, I really recommend it, the Mark Camille Shymowitz show at the um, Jewish Museum. Look it up. So um, there are a couple questions now in the chat and um, they, they're kind of, one of them is related to a question I have, so I'm just gonna ask it and uh, then maybe we'll have time for the other one as well. So this first question comes from Kathy J. A thought and a question. Sustainability is a word that is so, quote, fashionable that what is only slightly, quote, sustainable often hijacks this trendy for advertising, et cetera, purposes. It's a pleasure to see the real sustainability, to see real sustainability. As much of what is sustainable is so very high end, how do you suggest that this concept can become truly sustainable at all price points? <laughs> um, okay, I mean, you know, there are three days uh, seminars about sustainability. So I'm just trying to find it or define it very clear words. Uh, first of all, sustainability is a responsibility and understanding how you want to go and use your resources you have and, and how do you want to spend them. And um, since 20 years or even 25 years, sustainability has for me been at the beginning a huge hype uh, remember that we had in New York the first building, uh, the New York Times 42 Times Square, I think. It was like where Reuters is in it. This, that was the first green building in America. You had uh, hotels, first green hotels. Uh, so we all thought like, wow, that's a milestone. Uh, at the beginning, super expensive because you needed the, you needed the, the mass actually to start to use it so that you can actually bring down the production cost. Unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of resistance still with it because you have very unspirited people in the politics as leaders denying that we need to be careful about that. And perhaps I just say one thing, like you, you know what happened with the food uh, you know, 10 years ago, nobody was really thinking about organic food. And, and the first organic food you found in a corner in a supermarket on one shelf, and you were thinking to myself, why do I have to pay $4 for a melon if I can buy this one here for 50 cents? Because it was organic. There were no toxic ingredients in it. It was grown in, as I don't have to explain that, you understand. Uh, and then it was very interesting to see that people started to understand that it's actually healthier. It became also fashionable, but then also the suppliers, the, the, the food suppliers started to understand perhaps it should actually switch. And here in Europe, I don't know. I mean, I was in New York the last time and I was like impressed how much everything is organic and, and you find so healthy food there. And, and here in Europe, we really have it also. And it became part of like how you go and buy 
uh, groceries today. And I hope to see that happening because the more people actually say, I want to have this kind of food. So imagine if everybody says like, I want to have this kind of car or this kind of fabric or this kind of table in my place, which is made the same way like organic food, the more people will support that movement and the industry will, you force the industry to, 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 uh, to change the, the goal. Look, there are two ways. You can either hang yourself on a ship and chain yourself on a ship and, 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 and write Greenpeace on it. And it's a PR uh, effect. The photo will go around the world, will create a little bit of awareness. But um, I think my education and my philosophy is like, I wanted to go right into the middle of the machine where I have the possibility me as a person, as the creative director of companies and projects to actually influence and contribute and give the little direct change of directions to like everybody who works with me to make them understand this is, this is the way we have to go. Sustainability is never 100%, but if we can increase the percentage, if we can produce a product, you know, which is 60, 70, 80%, uh, in that scale, fulfilling a certain sustainability, it's still better than nothing, you know. So that's why we said, like, we don't want to go and uh, we don't, we have a five me 500 kilometers, it's 600 miles radius where we have to produce everything. And the temp temptation is big, you know, China is floating, India is floating with products. Every morning we have samples here. I'm not interested. I, I just say, I don't want to do it. We have Italy, we have Switzerland, we have Europe. That's, that's our hub and that's, where we, that's where, where we want to produce. I hope that I answered a little bit the thing, uh, your, your question. Um, I have a, a question that uh, adds to that, um, that I'm really curious about from your perspective. And I, I think I'm probably going to ask this of um, my guest each week. Um, because you all are at the forefront of manufacturing and you're making these decisions and you're exposed to all of the different materials that some of the people in this audience and, and myself might not know about. Um, what materials and processes are the most effective right now in the realm of sustainability? If you could just list um, a couple in each, you know, materials, a couple processes sure. you think are really, really, um, you know, solving problems are really hitting hitting the mark so that's where you need really also a chemist being part of that team you know like you need an organization or a chemist uh, or an engineer being part of it because sustainability doesn't mean it's just organic wool and it's hand knitted somewhere and then we sell it to like a project and it's falling apart or the color is fading off so we have to also understand what are the what are the parameters to actually come to that uh, ideal uh, result of having a product sustainable, performing, and at a at a good price? So, of course, like there are yarn suppliers which are cleaner than the other. Uh, we we, for example, for Zigzag Zurich, we have everything organic cotton. Uh, certified we use the linen which is certified belgium linen and and that certification process is like a, that's like pages of pages of pages of like reports and testing you know the ingredients you put for the dyes uh um you know then you have the european laws coming into it they they take one thing in one market away and it's still allowed in this one here and then you have to find out why is it, what is it, why is it allowed? And then you find out perhaps it's only because a trade issue, you know, because France doesn't want to sell it to Italy because France is producing it and they don't want to have the Italians taking over. So it's all this like, uh, you know, um, uh, all these like interferences on all different levels and, and, I think my my credo is really it's like do it and do it the best you can, and and then I hope that I find another 
designer, artist, not a supplier. All our suppliers are like, you know, certified to the extent where, and it's synthetic or natural wools, it's like, it doesn't matter. You can produce a synthetic fiber completely clean. Uh, it's not saying that synthetics are bad, you know. As I said, there are, there are plastics out there. They are biodegradable after three months in the earth when they throw it out and they don't end up in the ocean. Uh, but what is ending up in the ocean is actually the plastic we produced 20 years ago, PVC, like all the pipes. That's the one which is not biodegradable and cannot be uh, absorbed by the, the planet. And that's what we confront now. Sometimes you create a product and you find only out 20 or 30 years later that this product is actually not that great because it's garbage laying around, you know? Oh, garbage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to go just a little bit over because I want it, I want this other person, Veronica, to um, be able to ask their question and then um, we'll wrap this up. So uh, Veronica says, how do you break through in a photographic space with a textile that loses its essence in this digital era? <laughs> question <laughs> wait say again how do you break through and how do you break through in a photographic space with a textile that loses its essence in this digital era i i mean i'm guessing that's something about documenting textiles and communicating um you know i i don't know veronica do you have any more clarification or or do you want to just try to answer answer that <laughs> How do you do those great photo shoots and co communicate the, the beauty of your fabrics and like with the metal, for example, or the plastic, like how do you get people to see without feeling? Maybe that's what Veronica means. Okay, so of course we have a tactile product and, and we work really, really hard with our photography uh, and with our in-house team because sometimes the team is very easily happy or was at the beginning was like, we photographed this fabric, here are the photographs. It's like, we didn't photograph the fabric. We photographed a fabric, but not this fabric. And then they start to look at me. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, I don't get the essence. I don't get the essence of that photograph, what the fabric wants to transmit. So, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, sometimes we go a little bit, uh, we spend a little bit more time. We, it's, uh, we refine the way we work. We work with one photographer, two photographers. They understand our language. And, uh, and, and yeah, we, I mean, I, I don't release a photograph if I don't think like I have an immediate connection with it. That's never happening. But I wouldn't release a fabric if I don't have a connection to a fabric. I wouldn't release uh, that one either. It would just stay there and it's just like, you don't talk to me, I don't talk to you. We have to talk. If you want to go out, we have to talk. You know? <laughs> Otherwise you stay in the box. <laughs> oh, thank you. I think that, that, that probably answers the question. Well, um, I, we, I wish we had more time. We could talk all day, but you and I can reconvene later. Um, for people who want to see uh, the Four Spaces and Zigzag Zurich, you can certainly, um, you've probably noted the websites and um, Instagram handles also. Thank you so much, Michele, for taking your evening to talk with us at New York Textile Month. It's totally inspiring to hear you and really illuminating and some people are saying as much in the chat. Um, so yeah, off into the day and the night we go. Do you thank have any you. last words? I, I want to thank you, uh, Liz and uh, Lee and uh, Sagat, uh, I think was her name. And uh, to organize that, I think it's a, it's a great platform. And uh, I wish we in Europe would have more of that. But as we say, we get closer, look at this. We are in Zurich, you're in New York. 
people probably are all over the world. So that's the nice thing about globalization. But I wish you all uh, really an enjoyable time, especially now, and create, take your creations into your bed and make love to it. Uh, because then you feel that it's ready to be released and 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 uh, I hope really that you look today we are in the role of a mentor uh, so whenever we can I can help you uh, or we can help you like speak up you know it's the time that we have to give our knowledge and our way we work on to the young generation and I understand it's uh, difficult it's um, it's challenging, but like, keep it up and make the most beautiful stuff. Surprise us, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, for people who are having a great time hearing us um, and you want to share this with others, this talk and all others on Textile TV will be archived. Or I mean, there are already a couple archived in there, maybe a few. Um, so you can go on the New York Textile Month website and find the archives of these talks so that you can share them and watch them six months from now or whenever you want. Um, one of the many silver linings of this crazy moment we're in is the robust archive of talks that are now available for all of us to listen to in addition to all those podcasts and books on tape. Um, thanks again. We will see you next week um, at 1230 with Greg Voorhees from Sunbrella. All right, signing off. Goodbye, goodbye, Michele. Thank Bye. you. Bye everybody, thank you.